This week in comic books, everything is about chaos. From Justice League to the League of Superheroes, and that whole bit of chaos going on in there, to Marvel's Judgment Day, with a bunch of teams coming together and the chaos ensues. Even in Independence, with Beware of the Eye of Odin, and the massive amount of battle and chaos that's going inside of that. Also, at the end, we're going to talk about some recent pickups that I picked up at both a antique store and a local comic book shop. And we're going to talk about the difference between rebinding and a second print or a reprinting of a comic book. While well, I show you all a very special find. All that and a few other comic books right after this intro. Yeah. Right, come and never sleep on me. I some change to get night go get what you're looking at for nine noon. Hey, what's going on, you wonderful weirdos? As always, I'm Pocan Joe, and I'm super thankful that you're here today. Let's jump into this week's comic books, because we've got quite a, a small haul, but a lot to cover. So we're going to start right off with Detective Comics number 1063. Um, we're following that ancient family bloodline. It changed its name at one point, right, to Arkham. So now we have the Arkham connection going on in here. We brought back our Barbados character, not to be confused with Barbados. That's a country. But the lesser key is of Solomon, right? It's actually a demon. You get into the whole thing of demonology and all this other stuff in it, which you can look up online. There's a Wika page directly related to it but in this we get a little bit more understanding of the character buildings in here we find out that they actually have some powers uh, there's some sort of counsel behind them and how ancient they are and what their connection is to Gotham and of course the Arkham Asylum in that this has been very interesting I love the artwork in it the backstory to it um, the secondary story I'm not very interested in I got about halfway through it and realized I didn't care but for the most part I really love the depictions of everything in here and of course it's Ram V so you know it's a lot deeper uh, he's leaning heavily into this whole lesser king of Solomon's um, kind of uh, background to it is the best way to describe it being old and ancient but does it go all the way back to the time of King Solomon does his family go back that far I hope not I hope they just kind of let that and his, his family just kind of resurrected and found the secrets of King Solomon out. I hope they go that route. That would be interesting. I think that's a story. It doesn't really get enough focus. Also, again, the whole concept of music boxes in here being used, music psalms, all that kind of stuff, played heavily in here. A lot of prayers way back in ancient time weren't said the way they are today. They were generally songs. And this whole concept with the music box and the unknown tunes, right? The the seven chords that David played before the Lord, right? That whole that whole thing. I really dig this for a thinking person that kind of knows a little bit about this stuff, but wants to kind of see it brought into comic book life. I've been enjoying this like a skitty schoolgirl at a Korean pop concert. I really have been. This has just been great. Um, I recommend it, but I wouldn't pick it up here. Definitely, you're going to need the last issue to carry into this, no doubt. Uh, but good read. I, I, I highly enjoy that. Uh, next, over in the lands of DC, we've got Justice League and the Legion of Superheroes. Again, we're dealing with chaos here. We have the Legion of Superheroes. We have the Justice League. We had Doom, but now we just got their fortress. You know, the thing in the swamp that comes up. Yeah, we have that. And then we're just going to throw Vandal Savage in there just as the orderly conduct in it, the cold and personal, rational thinking villain in this, while everybody else is scrambling to figure everything out, and of course pointing at the first things that they can talk about to it. In this case, for some reason, the gold ring of the gold lantern is kind of a mainstay in here, but nobody really knows how it's connected. They just want it from him. And of course, he's not He's kind of reluctant in giving it up. I don't like giving up my stuff, much less any of my rings or anything like that. It's interesting. It's a bit muddled, though. You have to really kind of work your way through it. And if you don't understand the importance of the, the Legion of Superheroes in this context or in this run, or if you fell off the last two years of their runs, some of the characters may not make much sense to you. Like, what is a gold lantern? That whole nine yards. So if you're a little behind on that, yes. But yeah, just organized chaos, trying to make sense of everything. Definitely a plot building here, right? We're in between. Most of these issues this week are in between issues. Nothing really new. Again, moving on with DC, we got Batman Fortress. So again, 
kind of following that that concept of chaos, right? Uh, Batman's on the hunt for the Fortress of Solitude in this, and then in this one, and I'm gonna butcher this character's name. I want to say Deli, Deili, Deili, the the squirrel, the Green Lantern squirrel or chipmunk or whatever he is. Also, Detective Chip makes a, an appearance in here, and if you've ever watched the show before, you know how much I I just fascinated with Detective Chip. There's something about a chimpanzee wearing clothes, talking and smoking cigars that just makes me happy. I think we got kind of an animal story going on here. It's cheesy and as campy as that may be. It plays well into this book, especially if you know the characters and you're familiar with the characters in it, to know that they're not cutesy. Uh, one of the things we did learn in this is that the Fortress of Solitude has been pulled up out of its original roots in the Arctic and it's placed somewhere in the Marianas Trench. How do we get there? How do we find out about it? Um, that's where we kind of get dumped off here. But again, just great banter back and forth. And again, solid artwork in this. And uh, the dialogue's pretty well written. If you can get past the fact that a chipmunk is talking, it should be all right. All right, so that does it for DC this week. We're going to jump right into Marvel, and we get Judgment Day. So again, this concept of, of chaos again ensues in here. Constant battles going on. Every different blobs of the story are all over the place because there's this sense of dread that is happening too much is happening at one time you can't keep up with everything snap decisions get made and again it doesn't work out in the person's favor but they did the thing that i hate in here where it's all in your mind so dr sinister comes up with this idea of destroying the celestial who's really the world machine earth right attacking and placing judgment on all of humanity right kind of that case that this the the not so good side of a second coming if you will right that kind of thing and uh they figure out a way to kind of hurt it or destroy it but apparently it was a psychic leak i hate that kind of storytelling because then it just picks right back up into the existential problem of this thing passing judgment captain america failed its judgment gave him the thumbs down we're still dealing with this concept of mutants really being deviants but we also have the deviants showing up to join everybody in the fight as well because that's their nature to fight the eternals in that whole society if you will they're kind of the outskirts of society um, again story goes all over the place but it doesn't do it to confuse you or, or to dislodge you from the writings and it, it, it's really there to give you this sense of dread and as you read this you're like but this is there's a lot going on here <laughs> But it's purposely done in here. It's not a, a narrative error in any way. It's written to do that for you to can, kind of give you this sense of, of rushness and having to make decisions and try to figure out what's going on in the background at the same time. I thought that was really good. And of course, at the end, what we find out is, is to pass judgment, to pass this judgment, if you will, is everybody just needs to love each other and get along. So who do we bring out of the jail? Star Fox, you know, the guy who can manipulate people's emotions. So the question is, will the world machine in its celestial form see this as an authentic thing, or will it recognize it for the falsity that it is? Oh, so again, realism versus the act of. Which one's more real? Are, are they both really the same thing at the end of the day, or does it even matter? It's a good question. Definitely let me know down below what you think. And last, that was, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Fantastic Four pops off again. And, of course, we got to fix all of our past mistakes that made this story, this entire run, horrible, right? Uh, the Human Torch not being able to shut off his power, right? we got to go back to that space planet, uh, sky realm or something where uh, they built a machine, a MacGuffin, to kind of fix everybody in these unnatural mutations to them. Of course, Thane gets the opportunity to go in this thing and change himself to a human form, and now all of a sudden he's okay. He's married, he's got kids now, adopted kids. And, and you know, he's cool with himself now, right? He's evolved, if you will, over what we've known him to be before. Somebody's constantly whining about looking like a rock. Now he's come to accept this okay um i don't know i think it's still a mess because we meet reed richard's half sister in this and again now the chaos ensues 
chaos as a theme this week. And there was a, a point where they were transported into the microverse, but we didn't see the battle. We didn't see anything that really made it happen. We just see her wake up. She's super smart. And she's also rude and snarky for, like, no reason. <laughs> Again, this is one of those things where we're trying to show a character as being strong and independent. But in order for us to see them as strong and independent, they have to be rude, snarky, and cut people off all the time. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. I, I, I think that's a poor character of somebody. Uh, she's super into the environment and, and rebuilding the environment, saving the environment, and figuring out why tides are working the way that they are now. Plankton, the basic food life, food source for life in the oceans is, is kind of acting erratically. Um, and of course, you know, half brother, new half brother, really wants to kind of be involved in this kind of thing. So it's like you come on my adventure, I'll come on your adventure, kind of thing, so we can show some sort of empathy to each other. I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sure what they were trying to tell us in this. It just seemed like something to add fill the last few pages of a comic book. Really, uh, didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of glad. I'm hoping that this is the end of this and maybe reboot it, relaunch it, put us on another thing, whatever. Also, if you don't know, Reed Richards has like one, two, three, no, four, four half brothers, half sisters just hanging out. Apparently, dad was just floating through the multiverse, just banging it out at every truck stop with every truck stop lizard out there. <laughs> I guess. I, I don't know. It's a mess. All right, next. Beware of the Eye of Odin. So our hero here breaks away from his group. It's a quest story. Breaks away from his group. Finds out, yeah, he needs his group. Big, strong blacksmith, older guy. He gets poisoned by a spider. They send the girl away because they think she's insane. Because she thinks she's a Valkyrie. Come to find out, she's a Valkyrie. They show up. And this thing, for pages upon pages, is nothing more than the slaughter of trolls and orcs. <laughs> like, just non-stop chaos and when the Valkyries show up it gets even bloodier and messier at that point but this is a quest story so at some point they got to get back onto the quest and I believe they do that in the next issue not really a whole lot to talk about here all right so what did I pick up this week and first off thank you for staying this long definitely let me know what you think about the reviews in the comments down below so a couple of books I picked up this week I picked up uh, Mad Balls number one to go into my 80s collection. I picked this up at a local comic book shop. I only paid $3 for it, and it is clean, super clean. Next, uh, again, at the comic book shop, we got King Size Special. I love King Size Specials. And we got the Tower of Shadows. Uh, this is uh, pretty interesting, actually. I have notes on this, too, and I should have turned to that page. So this is a John Romita Jr.'s cover art from issue number two from the original run. So I just loved it, and it's almost impossible to find that issue number two or one of this series in any of my searching. If you've seen it, definitely let me know. Next, Chamber of Darkness. This is the first appearance of Headstone P. Gravely. Right, he's kind of like the crypt keeper of this series, right? That was a thing, right? You had to narrative through a character, and of course, there he is right there. So yeah, super cool monster cover. Look good in the cat, and I believe this was 1969. Good stuff. Here's an interesting one I did not know much about, and it's from 1977, and I picked this up at the antique store. The rest of these are from the antique store. Uh, Richie Rich with Timmy Time first appearance of Timmy Time in comic book form. It was a short-lived character. Did not last long like most things with Richard Rich associated with it. Um, it was just like a throw it out there. Let's see what happens. Now nah, we don't like it. Uh, next, uh, Jimmy Olsen number 151. Uh, this is from 1972. I put straight cover by monster, you know, giant grasshoppers. Yeah, super cool. Nothing super special about this book. I just like the cover. Next one, Transformers, and one I think people sleep on. 
uh, is number 42, and of course this will go into the 80s run, 1988. This is the first appearance of the Seacons. It's also the first appearance of Grand Slam and Rain Dance, but Seacons more especially, because I had that Transformer shark thing right there. And again, it was one of the ones where you buy them all, you could build a bigger robot. And they were all basically just sea bearing later to become Decepticons. Next, uh, another cover by, I love these kind of covers. This is Mighty Mouse number 10. Not, not that Mighty Mouse number 10, but this one. It's an homage cover to David Letterman, right? You've seen these before where they kind of homage something in real life. I just like it. And it gives the top 10 reasons why you should be picking up this comic book. And that's from 1991. Uh, next, again, back to the 80s collections. I think I have this, but... I'm not going to pass it up. It's Defenders of the Earth, the first adaptation of it in comic book form. Um, yeah, definitely. You got the Mandrake the Magician, you got the Phantom, uh, Flash Gordon, and then a slew of other characters that kind of join the line up there. So, yeah, really cool to get that. And that's from 1987. Next, I always pick this one up too whenever I see it, just because I like the spaceship on the cover. And it's Superman. 2001 or Superman 300 as it's better known uh, yeah this is just the retelling of an origin story in modern times but the modern time for this was 1976 this is a birthday yearbook for me too next I know I have this one but I was surprised to see it now mind you all these ones that I bought from the antique shop I got them for a dollar so this is West Coast Avengers number one uh, a lot of steam behind this book. A lot of people looking for it. You know, the whole Wonder Man thing's coming out. So, and I mean, it's mid-grade. Yeah, it's an easy mid-grade. I'll get a little dog tail up by the years and stuff. But for the most part, super clean. Super clean. And, of course, that can be part of the 80s collection, too. Next, from 1976, again, beautiful year. Uh, we have uh, Four Star Spectacular, number four. I just like the cover on it. it really, that there's there's nothing really else important about it. <laughs> Again, another one I always like to kind of keep packed away because I know as this comic book thing goes on and on, more people are going to become fans of like uh, more '90s comics, and I know they're going to get harder and harder to find. So I keep like some of these around for like gifting and stuff like that. And that's Exo Man of War and that Chromium cover. And this is his, basically his origin story. Good stuff. Uh, next, Flash, number 301. This is actually the first appearance of a villain. Colonel Compu Com Computertron. Computertron? That's it. Basically, he just puts him in a video game. Surprisingly, this game, this particular comic was ahead of its time. Because it kind of deals with putting somebody inside of a video game. Right? But just the pixelation on it. It's kind of cool. Uh, the next two are Marvel Classic Comics. I try to pick these up whenever I can. And one is The Pit and the Pendulum, one of my favorite stories. And the other one is War of the Worlds. Again, just adaptations of, of classic novels. Now, this is probably something you don't really get to see a whole lot of. And there needs to be a little bit of an explanation. But I have comics from Weatherbird. And what this has in it, this is a promotional for a shoe company uh, that was around in this one particular issue from 1955. So this is interesting because it has Jimmy Olsen, or I'm sorry, Superman Pals Jimmy Olsen, number five in it. And what was kind of cool is that I did a little research and come to find out back in the day when they couldn't sell a comic book, this is no secret, they would tear the cover and send the covers back in. And then they would have this torn comic book. So what would you do with that? Well, other companies would come and buy these torn comic books and use them as promotionals. They would just reband the book. In other words, change the cover on it. So technically, you have a Jimmy Olsen's number five in here, just different cover on it, that they would use as a promotional. As a matter of fact, it was pretty poorly done in most cases as the staples would be on the outside versus along the center in here because um, if you open this up and take those staples out you can actually still see where the cover was torn off and this was stapled onto it it's pretty interesting um, 
I know I don't have a Jimmy or a Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number five in my collection, but just something kind of cool. And and this particular company did this quite a few times. They even produced their own comic book for a while. But uh, it was super kind of cool to get this from 1955 with Jimmy Olsen number five in it and it not be a reprint. Technically, it's not a reprint. Well, literally, it's not either. It's the actual comic book, just another cover on it. So that was pretty interesting. I hope you found that interesting as well. Uh, definitely don't forget to subscribe, like, check out my other weekly videos if you're behind on your comic books. Uh, let me know what you thought about this one, and I'll see you around. Bye.